Welcome to the Eat for Endurance podcast. My name is Claire Shorenstein, and I am a board-certified sports dietitian and endurance athlete. I provide virtual nutrition services through my private practice, Eat for Endurance, and I host this podcast because I love sharing the nutrition stories of professional and recreational athletes, and I also enjoy teaming up with my sports dietitian colleagues to discuss a variety of important nutrition topics. Today, I have an athlete nutrition profile for you guys featuring ultra runner and coach Jess Woods. Jess grew up in track and field where she spent nearly a decade as a triple jumper. And then after college, she transitioned into distance running while working in broadcasting in New York City. She ultimately joined the ultra running community and started coaching. And then she switched over into fitness as a full-time career. She has run numerous ultra marathons, including 100 milers and beyond, and coaches many different types of athletes through Nike Run Club, Brooklyn Track Club, and Brooklyn Trail Club. We had a great discussion about her own nutrition and how that has changed over time, uh, especially as she embraced longer distances in running, as well as what she observes and teaches to her own own athletes. Jess also talks about how she hates cooking and what she does instead to keep herself well-nourished and support her very active and busy lifestyle. So with that all out of the way, I hope you enjoy my chat with ultra runner and coach Jess Woods. Jess, welcome to the Eat for Endurance podcast. How are you doing today? We are pretty good today, honestly. It is uh, yeah. a very rare, not humid day here in New York. Coached an amazing um, morning miles this morning, so it's a pretty good day here. And you said you booked a conference room. Where are you at? So, <laughs> it's going to sound fancier than I really am. Uh, I live in one of those buildings that tries to sell you on all the uh, amenities that it also has. Yes. So I'm just in my apartment building. <laughs> nice. I always wanted to live in one of those, but we did not succeed. <laughs> Besides some friends yeah. that had those amazing New York buildings where it had like, you know, the fancy pool and the gym and like all the amenities, which... I aspire to that. I know. I never, I never thought I would be here because I was in a brownstone for quite some time. But here we are. Are you in Brooklyn or where do you I live? Am. I'm in Brooklyn. I'm in okay. Bushwick. Nice. Yeah, because you coach. Well, obviously you coach Nike Run Club, but you coach also the Brooklyn Track Club and Brooklyn Trail Club. Correct. Yes. Yes. Nice. So, awesome. At least Brooklyn Trail Club is uh, outside of Brooklyn, actually. The whole sure. point is to get people outside of Brooklyn. But yes, the other ones are in Brooklyn or Manhattan. Yeah. Yeah. And um, speaking of outside Brooklyn, you just got back from Tahoe 200, uh, pacing and crewing that. Tell us all about it. Yeah, it was really cool to be on the other side of it because I... I mean, I have volunteered at ultras before, but not to this extent of crewing for someone and pacing for someone. And I just felt very overdue to give back to the running community in that way. So Mm -hmm. um, I was on the crew team because I I coached this athlete um, for like the five months leading up to the race as well. And then he asked me to, to come along and then ended up pacing him for three 18 mile segments and it was just really cool to see the other side of it and um I mean he was kind of writing the playbook of what you should eat for a multi-day endurance event um he did really well I mean like as well as 200 milers can go and it was beautiful there and he finished and finished within like well within the allotted amount of time so honestly yeah we're putting that one in the win column yeah, no, I, I watched a few of your videos where you guys were doing the shopping and <laughs> you were kind of, you're talking about the sleep plan and all that stuff. And it, I mean, the yeah, those races are just something else. That's like a whole different category of uh, of effort. And did I see correctly? I think I looked on Ultra Sign Up. You did Moab or it said unofficial. I wasn't I sure know. if you finished it or what went on there. I mean, <laughs> It's kind of cool what they do. So yes, I finished, but I I don't have an official finishing time. They, as long as you make it to the last aid station and leave the final aid station by the cutoff time, you're allowed to finish, even if you don't finish um, within the like overall 
cut off time. So I didn't make it mm-hmm. to, I made it to the final aid station in time and I left the final mm-hmm. aid station in time, but I didn't make it to the finish line within the, uh, okay. the cutoff time, but it technically isn't uh, a DNF. They, they give you, they say, they say you finish, but yeah, you don't get an official. Got it. Okay. That makes time. more sense. Yeah. But I wasn't sure what the unofficial <laughs> meant. Okay. Yeah, because I didn't say DNF, so I was like, interesting. What does this mean? I'll have to ask her. Um, well, we're going to put a pin in that because we're going to revisit fueling for ultra and essentially, and especially for the 200s. That's, again, just like a whole different thing, um, even compared to your own 100 milers. And I'm, and we can talk about the differences there. But, um, but yeah, I like to start these interviews by digging into your nutrition roots. I know you were born in Pittsburgh. And, um, you know, maybe you can just tell us a little bit about, you know, the kinds of memories you have surrounding food and meal times and all that stuff? Yeah, I would say that, um, I don't know if it's being from Pittsburgh or um, we're mainly Czechoslovakian, which is, uh, you know, a plate of brown food and a lot of meat and potatoes, but uh, that is definitely how I grew up. I mean, it was just a lot of um, simple foods, honestly, (laughs) and I didn't really venture out with my nutrition until I moved away to college and then eventually moved to New York where I definitely took advantage of, you know, all of the things that New York has to offer. But growing up, it was really simple foods like your meatloaves and (laughs) chicken Mm -hmm. tenders and potatoes, like, yeah, really simple stuff. And you've been a runner for a long time. I know you did track and field, your uh, sprinter, your triple jumper, all that. Um, as you kind of became more active and started competing, did any of that shift or change or was it all the same, would you say? It shifted a little bit um, in terms of what I ate directly before the meets, uh, the competitions, the races, because mm-hmm. it was um, it was our athletic trainer in high school that kind of went around and she was, she was quite the personality and um, she ever so kindly pointed out that if you eat like crap before your race, you're going to perform like crap. And just like the way that she she delivered that message really Mm -hmm. stuck. And it was, it was really her that kind of like took away all of our junk food and started bringing um, healthier options for us because I like, we were kids. You can fuel on a can of Pringles and gummy bears and still be fine. (laughs) But you don't, realize like how much better you could be if you actually put the right kinds of food into your body. So directly before our track meets, um, that kind of changed in high school once we had a little bit of a wake up call from her. Yeah. Did, was that, that kind of comment something that like, did it get the wheels spinning? Did it kind of lead you to make some changes or maybe go down a different path with how you approach all food? Or was it really just contained to, oh, yes, I just have to change what I eat before a meet and everything else is fine? Just because you know how some people might take a comment like that and be like, oh, I need to evaluate everything I eat. And maybe this might not be as good. You know what I mean? I'm just curious kind of what else, like, did that lead to any other changes or the way you approach food or anything? No, I don't think so. It was really just like directly around um, competition, like before and after, um, because we weren't like unhealthy growing up, mm-hmm. but it was just mm-hmm. uh, maybe not the most adventurous of foods or um, okay. like we went to the salad bar at Pizza Hut. Like that was, <laughs> those were the vegetables. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, hey, so it's like, still salad. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So I can't really say it carried over, um, but it was just moving, moving out is really what then drove kind of the trying different kinds of, of foods and opening it up to a more, to a bigger variety of foods, let's say. Yeah. So, I mean, tell me what that looked like. So you were still competing in college. Um, you were still track and field in college or what were you doing? Yeah, I was a, I was a triple jumper. Okay. Secretly hated running. I think like not to um, stereotype all field athletes, but I would say I was more on the field side of track and field than on the, on the track side. Um, So, you know, we enjoyed our short sprints and strength training days and doing 
all of the triple jump drills in the infield. Um, but I don't think I considered myself a runner until very much after college. Um, but what that looked like is I, I also admittedly don't cook. <laughs> so it's never said even now, even now, um, it is, I don't, it is not something I ever, I don't, it's like cathartic for a lot of people. And I, I do mm. not have that same experience. Like it is, it is not enjoyable to me. The whole start to finish is um, not enjoyable. So I was on a meal plan all four years in college, but um, there was just more choices, let's say, than like in the small town where I lived growing up. Um, yeah. Like I did, I don't think we even, I don't think we tried sushi growing up. Like it wasn't an option in Vandergrift, Pennsylvania. So. Sure. Sure. I mean, was that like, I mean, I imagine that must've been a kind of fun experience then if you're kind of at college and you get an option or this opportunity to just like try all these different things for some people, maybe that's scary and they're not into it, but it sounds like that was a more positive experience for you. Is that right? Yeah, for sure. Because it was like, and it's kind of like fake money, right? Like when, you... <laughs> yeah, like I'm, I, I'm sure I paid for that meal plan with, um, you know, student loans down the line. But at the time, like, sure, it's 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 monopoly money, so you can go and try as much crazy food as you want. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Um, okay, so you graduate college and. At what point, so you said you didn't call yourself kind of a runner or consider yourself a runner until afterwards. So at what point did distance running kind of enter the picture? I know you went into broadcasting, you had this whole career before you went to coaching and running and everything. Um, but where did that emerge and, and what did that start to look like? Um, I'm going, I'll, I'm going to date myself, but whenever I first moved to New York, um, right after college, there wasn't the, um, I don't, the menu of options that we have now in terms of fitness, like the boutique fitness industry didn't exist. It was either, you know, you joined Equinox or you did Bikram yoga. Like, I feel like those were kind of the main options. And, you know, after kind of trying some various forms of exercise, like nothing was really sticking. And it was my mm -hmm. best friend, she still is my best friend, um, who was always the runner of the group. And I used to watch her do like the New York city half marathons and think she was just the coolest. And I thought I would never be able to do anything like that. Um, and it was actually Lululemon that, uh, I stumbled on because they had the free yoga out of their stores. And then they also had a sign up that they had a free run club and mm -hmm. they were, they were the first run club that I ran with and they were very beginner friendly and, you know, patient enough with you. If it was your first 5k, first 10k, I ended up running my first, um, half marathon with them. Like it just, it, it grew and grew from there. And then, um, yeah, earmuffs to Nike, uh, that the, <laughs> that the first <laughs> run club was actually Lululemon. Um, but yeah, it, it just, it grew and grew from there. And, um, I feel like I tried every distance and I wasn't necessarily the, the fastest 5k runner or the fastest marathoner. And so it was really like at the start of the ultra marathon boom, I would say like right at the beginning of it when, um, it was still super new and still kind of weird and interesting. And I wanted to check out what that community was all about and, I went and volunteered at a race and after I saw it for myself and saw what the community was like and it just felt so different. It felt like a kind of like I was leading two different lives almost where like, sure, I still had my run club friends in the city, but then on the weekends I would leave New York and go to the trails or sign up for these ultra races. Like even just, we signed up for them all the time just for fun, just to like, we weren't racing them, but like, it was just an excuse to travel to different places and run on different trails. Um, and so that's how I got into it. It was very gradual, it was a very gradual build from 5k to yeah. 100 mile. But, um, I definitely just like fell in love with the ultra running community and how different it was at the time. 
Today's episode is brought to you by my company, Eat for Endurance. As you guys probably know, there are many of ways to learn from me and work with me. I have many free resources in addition to this podcast, which is of course free. Um, You can join my monthly newsletter. You can go over my website to do that. I send out lots of nutrition tips and recipes and uh, links to my latest blog posts and such. And that's a great way to get some free content if you want additional free content um, other than my podcast and social media. I also have some free digital downloads on my Teachable School. Again, you can find those links on my website. Um, I also have some very low cost uh, digital downloads, mini guides um, with some great nutrition tips for everyday nutrition, performance nutrition and such. Um, And then of course, I have my self-paced course, Peak Performance for Endurance Athletes, which you guys have heard about many times um, over on my website as well. And then if you're interested in working one-on-one with me, uh, I do have openings for my monthly programs um, starting in later in July. So please reach out, Claire at eatforendurance.com. I would love to hear from you. You can book a free call on my website, a discovery call to see if we'd be a good fit and to ask any questions you might have. Um, So yeah, you can go over to my website and do all of that uh, very easily. And of course, just reach out if you have any questions. All right, let's get back to the episode. Yeah. And I mean, I can relate to some of that. I, I did, I did some runs with Lululemon, although I mostly was, I coached a few runs with Lululemon. I was kind of like sub coaching for one of the Upper East Side stores for a friend of mine back when I was run coaching. And, um, and then I also were like, back when I got into, I think I got in a few, to ultra trail stuff a little bit later than you. Cause I think you started in 2012, I want to say. Um, and so I got into it like 2014, 2015 and, and just like, there was a, a group called trail whip ass, um, that we were, we would hang with. And then we would like, and then my husband and I would just kind of hop on the train cause we didn't have a car and we'd just escape to, you know, you know, different trails that we could have access to. And, it uh and then of course we run central park and we just run the bridle path from like oh <laughs> the two little pretend it's a trail um exactly. it, it is definitely um it's tricky from new york so uh you know it you know training for some of these races and and especially if you really love trails just getting out there is 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 tricky but wonderful and it's just such a nice treat to kind of escape the concrete for a little bit um but yeah, that's, that's awesome. And, and I, I remember, I mean, I lived in New York for a long time, so I remember that whole scene and how like the whole fitness industry just changed and, you know, the class pass and the Peloton and all the boutique fitness, you know, all that stuff kind of coming up. So it's, it's so different now. It's kind of nuts. Yeah. I don't even, yeah. Who knows if I would have even gotten into running if all of that existed, <laughs> yeah. uh, 15, 16 years ago, I might still be like, I don't know, taking my thousand class at Barry's boot camp. Not that there's anything wrong yeah. with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Um, did you ever coach at Lulu or you were, you were just kind of part of the run club? You're just running there. Yeah, I was just part of the run club. Um, and then it was after I, um, volunteered at this, uh, it's called the greater New York 100 mile running expedition. Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. Know, easily rolls off the tongue. And, um, <laughs> that's where I met someone from Nike. Um, and like long story short, she saw that I was pacing someone the last 20 miles of her hundred mile race. And she said, if you can pace this, you can pace anything. And she recommended me to, to Nike. And then I, I started pacing, um, the Nike long runs every, every weekend, like just, uh, just for fun. And that's Mm -hmm. kind of the domino effect of, Um, how I then like started working for Nike and like more and more opportunities started to come up and they asked me to come on as a coach. And once enough of those opportunities came up, that's when I, um, made the switch from, uh, and a broadcast engineer at NBC to teaching running. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I mean, let's talk about broadcasting for a minute. Cause I imagine that is such a crazy lifestyle. And in terms of like nutrition and just eating and trying to like get through that, that I'm sure it was like very hectic and, um, and you're young, right. You're fresh out of college and yeah. you're kind of in this career that's nuts and you're running on the side. And I know like you were kind of, I've heard you on another podcast talking about like leading these double lives. I imagine just taking care of yourself, feeding yourself. Was that a challenge? Was that something that you were kind of having trouble with or was it something that was was fine and it wasn't an issue 
I feel like maybe it would be an issue anywhere else but New York, but it's like when you're in yep. New York, <laughs> you are very much like spoiled. Now, I did spend six months in LA, which is a very different experience, and I was probably mm -hmm. the healthiest eater I've ever been whenever I was in LA because they just had more options. It was like everywhere you went, it's like half the menu was vegan and the other half was uh, whatever. So I just feel like sure, maybe working all of those hours um, and like trying to run after work or before work, I'm sure maybe that would be a problem elsewhere, but we're just so spoiled with being able to have whatever you want, whenever you want, like and all of these apps didn't exist, but at least Seamless existed still. Even yes, like that's years true. Ago. That is very so true. Yes. Could, <laughs> and like I was in Midtown, like you could, you could probably mm. still get like your just salad at 9 p.m. in Midtown, you know, like, so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think it was a problem just because of where, where I was. You, you could yeah. still get whatever you needed whenever. Yeah, no, for sure. I, I, now that I'm out in California and we moved out here, it's, it, and whenever I work with clients, cause I'm, I still have a lot of East coasters, a lot of New Yorkers and, but I have people who are more in like Silicon Valley or wherever. And it's just like a little bit harder <laughs> to do things <laughs> you, for sure. <laughs> yeah. I know, I know, I know. Um, well, let's talk about your transition to ultras and, um, you know, you've been running ultras for a long time. So it's been over a decade now and, um, and you've just been running for a long time, but especially distance. And, um, I'm sure over that span of time, you've learned a few things about fueling. Um, and I think you're also in, a, in this unique position that many coaches are where, um, especially in what you do, you see like a very wide variety of, of athletes. So you're working with, every, you know, people from beginner to very high level, and you're on the roads and you're on the trails. So I, 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 at least from my perspective, I imagine that you get to see this huge spectrum of athletes, right? And what they're experiencing. And I'm sure they're asking lots of questions and all of that. So before we go there, though, <laughs> maybe we can talk a little bit about your own personal evolution about, you know, approach to fueling or how you kind of support yourself. Because again, a newbie ultra runner with fueling, you learn a few things, right? Sometimes that way. <laughs> and, um, and you're kind of a little more of a veteran now. So what, yeah, what does fueling look like for you now in, in these races? And, um, and, and we're talking about during right now, not mm -hmm. outside, but yeah, during the race itself. And how did that, that change? I oddly feel like it's more trial and error when people are trying to figure out how to fuel during their marathon than it was uh, trial and error, figuring out what you could eat during an ultra. Cause it's just like, sure. The event is much longer and you're on your feet for much longer, but you have these aid stations that you pull up to and there's a million choices in front of you, whether it's like little bite-sized, um, peanut butter and jelly or boiled potatoes or watermelon. Like they try and have a variety of foods for you at these aid stations at ultras. And so I feel like it's, almost a little easier to figure out what you like and what you don't like for ultras versus like trying to break a certain time in the marathon because you're moving at such a higher intensity and obviously like using a different ratio of carbs versus fat for energy. And so, um, I don't even remember what, what the original question was, but like figuring yeah. out what you're feeling, <laughs> I would yeah, say you're feeling. Yeah. was not um, as big of an issue in ultra running because they try and keep the foods sim like super simple and the ultra community is beyond welcoming. When there's like a new runner that comes into the ultra running community, it's like, come on in. We're going to teach you everything we know. Like there was yes. no shortage of whether it was like my group of friends or like complete strangers at aid stations, just like giving you advice. And um, like the food is pretty simple and, you know, maybe not the healthiest to have on in your everyday life, but they try and keep like pretty simple real foods at the aid stations at ultras. And I mean, that seems to be what works for 
the majority of runners versus experimenting with different gels or goos and what works with your stomach, what doesn't, timing it specifically like in the marathon every 45 minutes or every 55 minutes. Like it just, it didn't need to be like that dialed in when it came to ultras. It was like, you just looked at the aid station, whatever looked good to you, you ate it. And then you like pack some in your pack, <laughs> like whenever you were on the go and just started like eating and walking on the go. So um, I just found that real foods versus like the gels or chews or chomps um, worked best for me. Um, whether it was meat and cheese steaks or um, applesauce or baby food or um, peanut butter and jelly, though I don't want to see another peanut butter and jelly for a very long time after Tahoe 200, thanks to Uncrustables. But um, yeah, I think, think real foods and like simple foods was kind of worked out early on and just stuck with it. So that, so that seems to be your strategy now. Like you're not really, you're not using any sports drinks or, or things like that to kind of get the carbs in. Um, I do also have like liquid calories. Um, okay. okay. So, cause that's always like a guaranteed way to get some calories and some carbs in, because a lot of times mm -hmm. during these ultras, you're going to hit a point where nothing looks appetizing, mm -hmm. especially mm -hmm. like these races that are in the middle of the desert where just in the heat of the day, a lot of things don't sound appetizing or yeah. these multi-day events. Like I just don't even want to chew at the end it just all sounds very difficult so mm -hmm. yeah you are right in that yes real food is like the main goal um but the bot like with the hydration pack and the two bottles in the front one is always water and one is I mean I use science and sport because it's like the most calories I could find in a liquid form um but yeah, there's plenty of companies. I started off with Tailwind, but then I liked science and sport better. There's tons of companies now that try and pack in as much carbs and calories as they can into a liquid form. Um, but I started off with science and sport because it was made for cyclists um, on endurance rides. And the whole point mm -hmm. was um, coming up with something so that they wouldn't have to go to the bathroom on the bike. And yeah. I was like, well, I also don't want to have to poop so let's, <laughs> let me try although, some sports. Uh, yeah <laughs> although with ultra i mean especially if you're doing like even a hundred mile like it's natural to poop at least once at some point you know oh like God, it's I, a I whole day so yeah. much yeah yeah i mean it's, it's it's the goal the goal should never be not to poop except for a say a marathon yes let's not poop yeah. in a marathon ideally <laughs> I'm not saying but, maybe like in no emergency poops. No emergency poops. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Normal poops only. Thank you. Yes, totally. <laughs> um, and, and I mean, and, and again, like I asked these questions and as we were saying offline, this isn't like a, how to fuel your marathon or ultra marathon. That's not the point of this. It's just to show the many different ways that people fuel, because I've had people on the show who literally only use sports nutrition products and barely use real food, you know? So it's, and then some people do a combo. So it's, it's, you know, there's so many ways to do this. I think that's really the, the takeaway and it's figuring it out. Um, I think most people have some form of sports nutrition, whether it's the liquid calories, as you're talking about, some people are saving gels for when they really need them or whatever. But yeah, I have a lot of clients too, who just really don't like the gels and they really just want real food and they'll sip on something to get a steady stream of calories in and, but yeah, there are lots of ways to do this, <laughs> as I always tell everybody. Yeah. There's lots of ways to do this, but I think like my two takeaways that I would be confident in saying from Tahoe 200 is like once you get into these extreme endurance events and like the multi-day events, then like, sure, there's many ways that we can do this, but you do need real food and real oh, meals. Oh, 100%. Yeah. Like, yes. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And also learned that it also has to be a variety of foods. Like it just can't all be sweet stuff. It can't all be the peanut mm -hmm. butter and jellies. Like it has to be yes. a variety of foods. So those are my so, two, two rules of thumb yeah. is like, a thousand percent least, agree. At least one, we try and make it a goal of like one real meal each day. 
And like, you can have like little bits and pieces of real food all throughout the day, but like taking the time at one of these aid stations where, you know, you start thinking about, okay, like 30 minutes has already gone by. Like I need to get going, but you need to like be in the right headspace. Like I'm going to spend an hour at this one and we're going to sit down. We're going to have a burrito. We're going to have some Coke. We're going to like sit in some compression boots, like actually eat a meal and then keep on keeping on. Yeah. And that's specific to like a 200 ish style. Like again, what you guys are saying, a multi-day when you're doing more of a 100 miler or maybe even slightly less, how does that change for you personally? Um, I would say I'm more of like a middle to back of the pack runner. So um, my feeling might be a little bit different than someone who can finish a hundred miles in 15 hours versus sure. uh, someone who's in the 24 to 30 hour range. Um, I, I, do, I use the like fuel early, fuel often method. So yeah, maybe I'm not sitting down for um, a big meal, but I'm not going to wait um, until mile 50, mile 60 to have some real food. Like you kind of have to for me, I have to force myself to start that early on. And it doesn't have to be the entire sandwich or the entire burrito that's at the aid station, like pack it with you to go. And maybe like every couple of miles, you have like a bite of it and you can like put it back in your pack and then just like slowly kind of graze on it until you get to the next aid station and then refresh. So yeah, I go with like the not sitting down because mm -hmm. since I am a middle to back of the packer, I don't have the luxury of time. Um, we're like chasing cutoff yep. times. So yeah. Yeah, I don't really have the luxury of sitting yes. down for, I, I'm, and, I'm right with you. Yeah. <laughs> so it's still the real food, but just, uh, starting early and, and, um, eating often and not, not necessarily sitting down for an hour to take some time to eat in a hundred mile race. So other than uh, the burrito and the Uncrustables, although they're kind of blacklisted right now, I hear, <laughs> what are some of your favorite kind of go-tos when you're out on the trails? Um, I like the baby food and that has stuck around. And um, even my most recent athlete who had never tried it before, he liked it when we were out there. And, but, and like by baby food, I feel like people imagine like a, carrying like a jar <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, you've seen a ton of it in the grocery stores now where it's the squeezable sure. yes squeezable pouches yes. and like yeah it's baby food but it's really just mushed up fruit and you don't even have to have it in one yeah. sitting because you can put the put the cap back on it and now companies have come mm -hmm. on that adults are eating these things and I swear they it's the same exact thing they've just like rebranded it for adults and like put the word electrolytes on it but I'm pretty sure it's just still and the charge same. like twice as much <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's still the same yeah. mashed up apples and bananas and whatever's um but I, I mean maybe it sounds kind of probably sounds kind of gross but I just like it because you don't have to chew it <laughs> I yeah. don't know Chewing and running can become hard <laughs> at a certain point. You just don't 100%. want to do it. Um, so yeah, nope. ba baby food has stuck around throughout the, throughout the years. That hasn't been 86 off the list yet. So baby food is definitely mm -hmm. a staple. And then um, something, something fattier. Um, so the, the like meat and cheese sticks, which might sound gross, but it's, it's going to, there's enough preservatives in it that it's not going to go bad. It doesn't have to stay refrigerated because Lord knows there's enough preservatives in there. Um, you can still toss that in your pack. And I don't know, it's just nice to have something salty. I know people bring like jerky with them sometimes, but again, it's like chewing, like it was really hard to mm. eat whenever yeah. um, you've been moving for quite some time. Um, so I describe it as like, if you are at a rest stop, if you're like a 12 year old kid at a rest stop and like, you're allowed to go in and buy snacks like that, that's, that's what my pack looks like when, um, running any of these ultras. Yeah. And are you ever running like shorter road races in terms of like marathons or things like that, where you're not using real food and you're kind of relying more on the sports nutrition products? Uh, I would say the closest 
race, like, yes, I've run marathons, but a lot of times it's um, like pacing athletes mm -hmm. or people that I've been coaching. Um, mm -hmm. But the closest thing would be, um, I really did actually race uh, this race here called OSR 30 or just street runners. It was a 30 mile road race. Um, so close enough to a marathon. And I went with the all liquid um, science and sport because I mean, the race didn't start until 11 o'clock in the morning. So you could have an actual breakfast. Mm. So that was kind of an odd thing where you had enough time to have a breakfast and have that digest and like get everything in order before the race. And so I felt like because of the later start time, I could survive on just the, the liquid calories and carbs because my number one fear was having to you know, mm -hmm. stop and use the bathroom in the middle of the race. Um, mm -hmm. So that was probably the first time I didn't have to use the bathroom um, during a race. And we we did race that 30 mile road race and survived on just um, the science and sport. Yeah. Okay. So it sounds like you've had some uh, maybe not so pleasant race nutrition experiences, perhaps, or you said your greatest fear is to have to poop. Was that from like a bad experience or you're just that you're just afraid of that? I just, I was afraid of that because that was a faster race. Like okay. I'm not as afraid of that in ultras because, sure. you know, two Whatever. minutes, what's, what's, what's another two minutes between <laughs> exactly. Um, exactly. But when you're actually racing a marathon or that 30 miler, like I would have gone from first to, I don't know, fourth place if I stopped for two minutes, like two minutes sure. is a lot of, a lot of time when you're yeah. competing for <laughs> silly to call a marathon a shorter distance, but yes. Um, so that's why I was afraid of it. Not necessarily because of any kind of traumatic experience, but because mm -hmm. like two minutes matters more in a marathon than it does in a hundred mile trail race. Yeah, no, hundred percent. Um, so tell me about, let's, let's go kind of to the coaching side of things. So you've also been a coach for a long time. And, um, and as I, I was saying earlier, like you really have this great perspective on so many different types of athletes. And I'm curious what your observations have been, um, in terms of fueling and some of the struggles that people have, um, or I don't know, any themes, any common themes you see, anything you kind of want to comment on. Obviously you're not a, a dietitian, but you, again, you are seeing you're, you're their coach. They're probably coming to you because unfortunately not everyone works with a dietitian and I'm sure they're asking you lots of questions and you're hearing just as you're running with people, you're hearing about stuff. So I'm kind of curious what you've kind of gleaned from your athletes and learned or observed or um, the themes you've seen. Yeah, I would say that since I am not like a nutritionist or a, a dietitian, there's at least some like guidelines that you can give to the runners sure. that, mm -hmm. um, you know, are kind of the standard in terms of like every 45 to 60 minutes, like put something into your body. Like we, so there's kind of some general rules of thumb, but how I approach it with my runners and my athletes is we talk about using every long run in their training as an opportunity to practice. And so not waiting until, you know, the week before, two weeks before to start practicing what they're going to be eating um, and fueling with for race day, but like literally every long run leading up to it, because if it doesn't work and you have uh, an emergency or something doesn't agree with you, it was practice. Like there's always going to be another opportunity to do your long run. So um, I approach it like trial and error because as you know, everybody is different and like what works for me is not going to work for my male athlete who can run a two hour, 47 minute marathon fueling on dates in his pocket. So, like, but you know, I'm so glad that we figured out, but it's real food. He discovered real food, but, um, dates, um, so yes, I, I try and guide them to um, like trial and error, using every long run as an opportunity to practice, whether it's um, how often do you want to be drinking water? Are you going to be um, taking in water to thirst? Or are you going to be timing it and setting up an alert on your watch? Um, 
what are you eating the morning of your long run? It's, it's just really trial and error. Um, since, you know, I can't necessarily guide them on exactly what to eat since sure. I, I do see that it is quite different for everybody, but, um, yeah, at least practicing like the every 45 minutes, what works, what doesn't work, just start grabbing a variety of, um, you know, sports nutrition at the beginning of your training and not waiting until the end. Yeah. Are you like, as a coach, kind of look at keeping an eye out for red flags where you really are kind of, um, like if something's standing out where someone really needs extra help, or maybe someone really is under fueling or struggling with someone more than others, where you're trying to recommend they kind of go work on that with someone else or anything like that. Cause I, I imagine you must see so much you know, because yeah. only a very small fraction of people who actually need help seek help. <laughs> so, um, you know, again, from that perspective, I'm, I'm curious, like how that works for you. I would say probably the biggest theme that I see is not so much the fueling during, or maybe even the morning of or leading up. It's the fueling directly after the run. Uh -huh. that seems to be the problem. Um, I just hear a lot of excuses is like, well, nothing looks good. And like, I can't mm. eat after I run. Like, I don't want to eat. Like, it's just my stomach doesn't feel. It's like, there's all kinds of like reasons why they don't feel right after the run. But I would say that's like the number one thing that I see and what worries me and like that I really try and drive home because I would consider myself a very, um, understanding coach and I'm not I don't have that coaching style where I'm gonna like hound you and yell at you yeah. and you better be doing this this and this yeah yeah, yeah. When it comes to like just consistently not fueling after a long run and then like all the trauma that you just put your body through like that's when I'll like really try and step in and it's like, there's just no excuse at that. I don't care if your stomach doesn't feel good, have a ginger chew, drink half a beer because that helps <laughs> bring your appetite back. Like there's all kinds of, if you, and if nothing would have a chocolate milk, like I don't care as sure. long as it's um, something. So I would say that's probably the, the biggest thing that I kind of um, see and, and fight with <laughs> is the fueling directly after the long run. That's probably the, yeah, the number one thing that I see with the athletes that I directly work with, or even just, you know, that come to the group runs, right? We're all guilty of it. We like immediately go to a bar afterwards and like have our social beer. And then next thing you know, it's been like two and a half hours and you're finally home and you're finally eating. So um, that's a, an ongoing theme, I would say. But there's yeah. plenty of there's plenty of solutions now, whether it's just carrying like a packet of powdered protein, like with it doesn't even take up room in your in your bag that you can just like quickly mix with water and have after your run or your workout. But um, yeah, well, you're giving me an idea. Maybe that's my that's maybe that's my soapbox <laughs> that I'm going to stand on this well, year. You know, I'm training. Well, so, yeah, one of the things I'm going to say, I mean. You know, I always love talking with coaches because, and I, and I have coaches that I talk to and sometimes, you know, they're learning for me and I'm, or I'm working with their athletes or whatever, but like, you know, especially someone like you, you, you reach so many people, you know, you have this big platform and your group runs are huge, aren't they? Like how many people do you get in your runs? Uh, it depends. Like we have 700 people in Brooklyn track club, but not all yeah. 700 people ever oh, like show up sure, at sure, the sure. same time. But what about like the Nike um, runs? The Nike runs are really big, aren't they? Yeah, like during marathon training season, we'll probably have upwards of like 300 people showing up yeah, to exactly. um, I mean, a long run on any given day. I remember seeing you guys in the park, just this hordes of people <laughs> with the speakers and everything, <laughs> you know, like I just remember all the, all the people. And, but my point is like, you know, it sounds really simple, like eat after a run, but it's actually in practice something that so many people struggle with. And yeah, and as you're saying, like, you have the capacity to, um, to, you know, they listen to you, you're their coach, you know? And it's, so yeah. I think that'd be a great, I think that's a fantastic idea. Like to and really it's like circle to like, we're in New York yeah. city. There's no excuse. Like, oh yeah. You can have anything you want, wherever you are, 
whenever it could be, you know, you finished your long run at seven o'clock in the morning, you can go and get breakfast at Shake Shack that opened early. Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, for sure. Or you can like stuff a little, some sort of energy bar, or some sort of bar or something in your, pa- the, the, the thing that I, re- I mean, again, I still work with a lot of New Yorkers, but I used to work with way more and, you know, the, the evening track sessions were always so tricky because people would come off of work and they don't want to eat too much before the trek is high intensity, but then they have the track sessions always somewhere. And then they have this long commute home and then it's like nine o'clock by time to get, you know, it's like a whole thing. So we would come up with all these strategies. Okay. Like you're going to have this sandwich, like it's going to be like a little mini dinner at this time. And you're going to make sure you bring this so you can have it right after practice. And, you know, there are things you can do, but it takes effort. And quite frankly, not everyone wants to do that. They're like, oh, it'll be fine, you know, whatever. So I think it's just kind of reinforcing, like, actually, these things make a huge difference. Um, I'm curious, do you find that people tend to eat before your runs? Or is that also something that's a struggle? Um, I would say, like, a handful of my runs start at 7 o'clock in the morning. And so... um, for better or for worse, uh, like, especially maybe these easier runs, um, recovery runs, community runs. Um, mm-hmm. I am also guilty of it where like, I, yeah. I mean, it's seven o'clock in the morning. It's a 5k easy run. Um, so no, we're not maybe all eating before the run, but <laughs> I would say that, um, I kind of draw the line at, if it's going to be if it's going to be greater than 45 minutes, like even if it is early in the morning, first thing in the morning, then you have to like put something in your body before the run. I can't really do it um, in a fasted state if it's going to be beyond 45 minutes. Um, But yeah, some of these early morning runs, the 7 a.m.s, I would say that, yeah, there's probably a a solid group of people that aren't fueling um, before the run. But I don't know what the... um, the sciences in terms of like time of day. I don't know if that matters. Um, like, like, can we do a workout in a fasted state? Um, because it is the first thing in the morning and then like start the fueling process. Um, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, you, you can, but you should not. (laughs) Yeah. That's, that's the answer from research is that, um, you really do benefit from eating, even if it's before a short run. So that's generally what we're recommending. Um, but it's one of those things where people don't always feel the difference. So they don't, you know, think it matters. And I think as you get older, you feel it more. And then it's, it's thinking about like the greater picture of things. But, um, but I, I mean, I definitely see both sides being a challenge for people. So that's why I was curious, kind of what you've observed just from your coaching lens. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, we definitely so. drive it home for, for the long runs for sure. Yes. And, um, we are our global head coach coach bennett has you know posted things like he puts his snacks in his um nightstand <laughs> beside his bed and like sets yeah. his alarm 2 hours early just to like roll over have some food and then go back to bed um you know yeah. if you aren't into waking up 2 hours early before your long run you can just wake up for a little bit eat your snacks and then yep. back to bed for a little bit. So we really, we do try and drive that point home for the long runs, but I guess I don't make as much of, um, uh, and I don't put as big of an emphasis on it for kind of our shorter 7 a.m. sessions. Yeah. I mean, what I, what I tell people is like, it can be as easy as having some chews or having some sports drink if you can't tolerate something else, or maybe you're having like a banana or some graham crackers or something or an applesauce pouch, you know, something so easy, easy to digest. Um, so, but it's like with anything trial and error, you know, like play around and see what feels good to you and see how it, see if it makes a difference. You know, I always tell people, I'm like, try it out, see how it feels, see if it makes a difference in anything. And you know, go from there. But um, I want to kind of shift to everyday eating because you mentioned you hate cooking and that's not something you enjoy. And of course, living in New York City, like that's really easy to (laughs) not cook and and all that. So I'm curious for you, um, you know, what that looks like, maybe what some of your go-tos are, what kinds of foods you enjoy outside of just around exercise um, and all that. 
Um, I did find a company that at least I go through waves. Of, so like, I really will try for a few months with cooking. Um, but now I'm in my like down phase because, uh, the boyfriend is really into grilling in the summer. So at least like we're getting some real food in that way because he, mm -hmm. <laughs> he enjoys uh, cooking or grilling dinner in the summertime. But um, I did find a company where it's not one of those um, uh, delivery companies where they're sending you prepared meals that you're just like putting in the microwave. Like I've tried those as well. And I'm sure there's great ones mm -hmm. out there, but I feel like I need like three of those in order to um feel full which yes. probably defeats the whole mm -hmm. purpose um but they're uh i'm like not sponsored by any of these companies but whatever it's called hungry root where it is simple enough that i can actually do it and it's not like mm -hmm. um it's not like a purple carrot company where they s just send you a whole bunch of ingredients and you still have to figure it out like this company was simple enough and it's basically like here's these three ingredients jess can you just like warm them up in a frying pan and put it together and eat it. So, and, and it was all like, uh, high quality, um, foods and it, it took the, the guesswork. Out. I just need someone to like, tell me what to do or just totally. like here, just here. You said you want, um, like five lunches included, like here you go. And I can trust that it's, um, like healthy enough and well-balanced and I'm for once eating my vegetables. Uh, so that company I've has is like the one that has stuck with me where it's like easy enough that I'm actually going to do it. Um, mm -hmm. but otherwise, yeah, it really is the, um, eating out. And I would like to think that it, that I at least give myself a variety. So I'm not the type that it's like, I have my one place and I'm going to eat there every single day. Um, mm -hmm. though that, you know, I do that with other things like music where we're just going to like, like something to death. Um, but like, yeah, I'll try and throw in like a sushi night versus like a salad night versus like, you know, treat yourself to a burger and fries night. So I feel like there's at least, um, variety, even though I'm not cooking for myself all the time. Mm -hmm. And your, so your job right now, um, so you're primarily coaching. Are you kind of like on the go all the time? Like, what is your schedule look like? Because like, I mean, I guess on the go in New York City, again, you have access to all kinds of things. There's never an ex like you can always pick something up. Um, but yeah, I mean, I feel like the life of, of, of when you're in the fitness world, it can be like it, weird schedules and you're all over the place. Like, what does that look like for you right now? Yeah, I at least have like, I guess, emergency food on me at all times, because there yeah. is no, yeah, it's like my routine is like, there is no routine where, you know, some mornings I do have the the coaching at 7am. And then maybe I'm coaching um, some smaller athletes, some kids at like 3pm after school. And then maybe I have another session at 7pm in Central Park. So you kind of all over, and then like bopping back home to walk the dog. Uh, so it can be all over the place. Um, and so I do try and just have like the emergency, um, like a, some sort of packet of uh, protein powder. And I'll like bounce between um, different, different brands, but some sort of packet of protein powder, like in an emergency where I could just mix it with water. Um, and that's good because, you know, it's not going to go bad. I can keep it in my bag at all times. Um, and there's always a steady stream of caffeine on me in my bag as well. And then, um, I also work for chair Bundy, which is a tart cherry juice mm -hmm. company. And so, um, for better or for worse, I have no shortage of tart cherry juice in my apartment. And so that <laughs> is always in my bag as well. So, I'm, I'm always ready for the uh, post run recovery with the, with the tart cherry juice, but um, yeah, I'll, I'll yeah. always keep some, some emergency snacks in the pack. And uh, I don't know if you've tried it, but also the um, Morton came out with um, a bar and it's, it's really, it tastes just like a rice crispy treat. I and so saw that. I haven't tried yeah. it yet. No, oh, that's really? Okay. Little... I have to try it. I have to try it. It looks yummy. It is very yummy, and it and if you're the type of person that hates eating early in the morning before a run, it is finally like, because some of these bars are 
like dense, you know, even though it's like just a bar, like yeah. still you're yeah. like, mm, yeah. this isn't or what I really want chewy. in the morning. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so love those. It's like a treat. It's a rice crispy treat. It's easy and it's small enough. It feels like the, the perfect amount. So, um, that's always a good snack to keep in the I really like the well. scratch bars too. I don't know if you've tried, I don't know if, yeah, I don't know if you've tried the scratch ones, but they're, um, they're just like kind of a chewy granola bar with some salt in them. So it's kind of like salty sweet and it's pretty small. So it's kind of sounds similar. I had someone make homemade scratch bars. I didn't know you could make them, but they must put like a recipe on their website or something. But oh. he came, yeah, he came to Trail Fest with homemade I don't know. scratch bars. Hmm. And there must be a recipe because they also sell the foil. Like he had scratch branded like foil that they were yes. packaged. Yes, them in. yes, yes. The wrapping. Like, yes, what? yes. I've seen that. Yeah. <laughs> so... I, I love yeah, I love scratch. They also had cookie mix, which was delicious, by the way. They had like just normal chocolate chip cookie dough mix that was like it was like a powder and you just add some things and it was so good. Yeah. <laughs> but the, um the scratch but, like, even, like a cookie, like life. that could have been a pre run. Yeah. Yes. Totally. Yes. And For you mentioned reason? caffeine in your bag. Oh yeah. Caffeine in your bag. What, what, yeah. What, what is in your bag that has caffeine? Uh, Celsius, which is like probably your worst nightmare oh. to hear. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Pretty <I am> much. <laughs> the beacon of health and wellness over here. Um, yeah. So Celsius came out with a little packet as well that if you don't want to carry the can with you you can have a oh, packet of powder that you can just I mix see. with water and get your celsius oh, fix God. on the yeah. go yeah just like just straight to the straight to the veins yep <laughs> i can't help it it's my i honestly addiction. like i don't know how you guys do it at yeah. No, I honestly, I don't know how you guys do it as coaches. Like the 70, I mean, cause I imagine you must have like 7am and 7pm runs in the same day. And that to me is just like my worst night. Yeah. <laughs> like I can't, I can't do both. <laughs> see, maybe you um, see us too if you had 7 There you go. And 7 see, I, yeah, exactly. I feel like you have to like keep something going to like keep yourself awake. I don't know. Um, what, I mean, are you training for anything right now? Like what's kind of going on with you? Um, in terms of your own stuff? Uh, that's, that's a good question. Um, I would say I, I considered that Tahoe 200 race, even though I wasn't the runner, I felt like I needed to train to be the pacer. Because, yeah. Um, you said three 18 mile stints, like that's yeah. significant. <laughs> and you know, it's going to be going to be slower at that point, but still like even just being on your feet yeah. for that long. So even though it wasn't my race, uh, at least it gave me something to, <laughs> to train for. And then a total mm-hmm. plot twist this year, um, uh, which sounds strange. I'm going to be running a road marathon, which like mm. on paper, it doesn't sound like it would be scary if like I used, like I usually do these um, ultra endurance events, but I feel like a road marathon, there's something like very vulnerable about that. And, uh, like, I oh, can't, yeah, I, I, can't, I am right with you. <laughs> I can't like hide in the middle of the woods and like, just be happy with completing it. Um, you know, there's mm-hmm. some different, like whether it's self-induced or outside pressures that come along with, um, running a marathon. So that's my like uncomfortable thing this year is, um, is running a road marathon. Mm-hmm. And it's the, um, it's the inaugural race. It is the, um, women's, it's a women's only marathon. Oh my God, I can't even screw up the name of it, but it's by, um, milk, the, the, the got milk. I don't know if you've seen ads for it, but, um, every uh-uh. woman's marathon, there we go. It's called every woman's marathon in Savannah, Georgia in November. Um, so oh, wow. it's nice that it's like a safe space, women, um, women only race, um, open to all ability levels. But yeah, going to go back to the road marathon for the first time in a very long time this year. Do, do you think that pressure, I mean, does it just come from being more of a public kind of coaching figure or is it pressure you're putting on yourself as well? Yeah, I think so. Even though at the end of the day, nobody cares, right? I know that nobody cares. Yeah. And that's what I tell all of my runners that put uh, pressure on themselves is like, ask someone a month after your race, like if they remembered what time you ran, nobody 
nobody remembers, yeah. nobody cares. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I will put pressure on myself because, you know, I really only pick one or two races every year and I try to be, uh, an inspiration to all of my athletes that I coach, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or in a group setting. And so I want to, um, set a good example. And I know that setting a good example doesn't come down to what time you ran. Um, so but there's still, yes, inherently, I feel like with a road marathon, there's, it's, it's a number that people are very familiar with. And so, I mean, that's why I got into ultras was nobody asked you what your time was anymore. Once you mm -hmm. said that you ran a hundred miles, but I feel like that's always the follow-up question after you complete a marathon is, oh, what was your time? And, um, whether they remember that time or they actually care what your time was, it just, it's just the, I don't know, naturally always the follow-up question um, after you tell people you ran a marathon. So yeah, I would say there's a little bit of pressure, but it's it's not maybe a certain time. I just want to do well and set a good example. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Are there any bucket list like trail races that you haven't done yet, or maybe there's one you want to do again? Um, I mean, Western States was on the bucket list. I feel like I had entered and it's not even a lot of times. I feel like, I think I was in the lottery four or five times and um, you know, it takes some people 10 plus tries to get into that mm -hmm. race sometimes, but I don't know. It just felt like after four or five attempts, I was like, Oh my God, what am I doing? And so it, yes, it would still be nice to <laughs> run Western States. Um, but I, it, it's not like my primary focus, I guess. Um, I try and pick one big adventure race every year, not, not even just one big something different every year. So I want to try a timed race next because that's something that I haven't done, whether it's a 12 hour or a 24 hour, you know, four days at the fair, whatever it is. Um, just trying something with a, a timed run versus complete a hundred miles, you know, as fast or as slow as you want, as long as you finish sure. it. Um, so yeah, there's some like bucket list styles of races that are on my list. Um, whether it's a backyard ultra or a timed race or something like marathon de Saab, where you're carrying all of your gear with you and setting up, um, camp and having to carry all of your fuel with you for however many days. And you don't have the luxury of stopping at all of the aid stations. So there's still some like different styles of races that, um, I would like to run, um, but maybe not necessarily like, oh, I need to run Western States or I need to run Hard Rock. I, I just kind of want to keep trying these different styles of races because as a coach, you know, it's all about continuing to learn and like using myself as an experiment of N equals one and trying to learn something from all of these different races that I can pass down to my athletes. And it doesn't even have to be passing down to my athletes that are training for an ultra. Like you can take these lessons learned um, from whatever race I pick every year and <laughs> take some lessons learned uh, in some shape or form to pass down um, every year. Totally. Um, one last question, recovery. So I know we mentioned Cherubundi, which obviously tart cherry juice, huge part of recovery um, for many people. Other than that, what are you doing for yourself to recover? Because being active is such a huge part of your job and you're doing your own training on top. So I imagine you really got to dial in your, your own recovery. So what, what things do you really try to prioritize to help yourself uh, feel good? Um, well, as a female endurance athlete, um, I know by now that it's very important to um, have enough protein. So that has been my big focus this year, whether it's like in a powdered drink form or real food or um, a chocolate milk or a chocolate protein shake from a bodega. Like that's been my main focus this year. I mean, thanks to the trailblazers like Dr. Stacy Sims and um, just at least the the handful of research that we have now showing that women actually need more protein than what is advertised as what we're used to. Like the, oh, you need 20 grams of protein after a workout. And then it turns out that women actually need more than that. So 
that has been um, like a big focus of mine this year specifically because I am uh, getting older and I am a female and I just know that that becomes um, more and more important. And, you know, I don't have the luxury of being um, a teenager eating a can of Pringles before a track meet anymore. So (laughs) yeah, I feel you there. (laughs) So uh, this year is a big focus on um, getting some form of protein into my body um, right after a run or a workout. Yeah. I'm on the, I'm on the chocolate milk. I'm back on the chocolate milk train this year. I love chocolate milk. It's so good. (laughs) Awesome. Awesome. Of course, but that's not like your calories or your protein or anything like that. That's just like nature's anti-inflammatory. So other than Chandler Bundy, it's the big focus on protein. Yeah. Awesome. Well, we're just going to wrap things up with my quick bites questions and then I'll send you back to your, I don't know. Do you have another run today? Are you coaching more today? Are you done for the day? I guess it's Friday. I don't know what you... It's Friday. God willing, we're done for the day, but I'm leading a trail run tomorrow morning. So we just got to get like, packed and prepped for that. Where are you guys going? We are going to Beacon tomorrow, which is oh, kind nice. of the, the farthest we'll go because it's a solid like 90 minute train ride. Um, mm. So for taking New Yorkers out of New York and it's it's the furthest we'll go on the on the Metro North for, for just a day trip. Um, so yeah, we're going to Beacon tomorrow. It's short. But the, like the, the run itself is short, but it's challenging. Oh, fun. Fun. Yeah. yeah. We used to go to, when we used to go to Cold Spring and yes. oh, what's the, what's the Scrambly Rock one? What's that called? Breakneck? There. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. We go to Breakneck and we do some sort of big loop and in Cold Spring, get ice cream at that mm-hmm. yummy ice cream place and then take the train back. And that was a really fun training day. <laughs> yes. I don't know what's wrong with Cold Spring in the summertime though, but like the bug situation there is just not oh, no. it. Yeah. It's, so we're, we're avoiding okay. Cold Spring and going a little farther north to Beacon. Got it. Okay. All right. So what is your favorite post-race meal or snack? Oh yeah. I feel like we went there. It's like chocolate milk and well, gosh, it's all liquid. It's like chair Bundy chocolate milk and an I <laughs> and a cold IPA. It's like, just like all drinking all things. Yeah. Triple fisting things. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what has been, well, I guess I know you don't cook much, but maybe amongst the times you have, what has been your biggest cooking catastrophe? If you've had one. Oh God, a catastrophe. See that there's too many to pick one from that. If you were like, oh, what was your biggest cooking success? I'd be like, well, I can count on one hand. Oh God, biggest cooking catastrophe. I feel like I burn everything and I follow the directions because I was a scientist. Like all I know <laughs> is how to like follow the directions. So I don't, my catastrophe is I don't know how to cook by feel or by taste or like this microwave is different from this one. Like I am following the directions exactly how they say and nine times out of ten it does not work out well then i guess those recipes god no the okay so those recipes are okay because it's just like just heat this up yeah it's like, this is a pre-cooked <laughs> chicken so Press even if you this button it's like my god even if you don't heat it up on the frying pan enough you're not gonna die because it was already a pre-cooked like chicken like you're you're gonna be all right <laughs> Yeah. It's a good thing you live in New York. New York will take care of you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that your boyfriend grills. Cause then you can just kind of assemble things and it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Grilling's okay. Yeah. Grilling's fine. <laughs> um, what is the most exotic or interesting food that you've ever tried? Ooh, um, I'm not going to know the name of it off the top of my head, but, um, like one of those 27 course, like chef tasting sushi made right in front of you places where I don't, I think I was eating like, I don't know, male fish sperm at one point. Like, I don't know. I don't know. I think that's what he said it was. So yeah, some crazy fish sperm thing at one of those, um, chefs, uh, tasting menus. Did it taste good? Oh yeah. When you go to the, it's like, you just, you just, you just trust you you're stuff. like whatever yeah. like honestly don't yeah. even tell me what it is I bet it's gonna be yeah. good I think it's worse if they tell you what it is. yeah <laughs> um how do you like your eggs cooked if you eat eggs very scrambled 
very like, scrambled okay. or, or hard boiled. Like I, I don't want to know that it's an egg, I guess. <laughs> okay. <laughs> not, not runny, not poached. Like yeah, it's, it's just a texture thing. So very scrambled or a hard boiled egg. I feel like I don't even need to ask the next question because we already answered it, but what is your favorite beverage? <laughs> well, my favorite beverage is a cold IPA after a long, hot, trail run supplemented with chocolate milk Other liquids. Yeah. Um, there's just and it can even be the athletic brewing ipa there is just a non-alcoholic ipa there's just something about a cold beer at the end of a long hot trail run that that hits just right what are your comfort foods mm, comfort foods i am maybe this goes back to my roots man um like mac and cheese, burger and fries. Uh, like when I let myself get to the, like, oh, it's been too long and we're really freaking hungry or that tends to be what I crave. Like when you're out on the trails for some time, you're like, I'm gonna have a burger and fries whenever we're done. So I would say those are two big comfort foods. What's your favorite ice cream flavor? Something with a lot of uh, cookie dough pieces in it. And what are your top three items of gear that are most essential to your active lifestyle? Ooh, gear? Mm-hmm. Um, I would say, I mean, do we count shoes as gear? Mm-hmm. Shoes would be my everyday running shoe, my Nike Invincible, because I'm old now, so I like cushion. Um, so it's like <laughs> our cushiest shoe that we make. So the Nike Invincible, um, and I'm a bag lady. Uh, so I would say whatever giant um, backpack I'm using that week, I do have like a couple. Uh, so the Nike Invincibles are non-negotiable. A backpack with a ton of pockets to store all of my like emergency snacks and caffeine and lacrosse ball and minivans and change of clothes. Um, and third thing, I would say it's like my, okay, that's also in my bag. I would say it's like my bundle of like physical therapy stuff. I have like the voodoo band, a lacrosse ball and mini bands on me at all time. And I feel like if a runner comes up to me with any injury, I'm like, we can fix it with one of these three things. <laughs> and that's Luco awesome. Tape. We're just held together by Luco tape and um, mini bands, really. Nice. I mean, I feel like you have to have a huge bag with all your stuff because you're just roaming around the city, like doing all your different things. Right. Like, I mean, I remember living in the city and having like all these different appointments all over the place and just basically carrying the house on my back. So, mm -hmm. you know, now I just do it and I just put it in the car, but same. Yeah. So there we go. Awesome. Running yeah. shoes, backpack with a bunch of pockets and my physical therapy gear. Final Great answers. answers. Final answer. Good answer. Um, well, thank you so much, Jess, for joining us. Um, where can everyone find you online if they want to give you a follow or reach out or anything like that? Um, probably the easiest place is Instagram. Try and stay on top of all of the messages and comments there. So it's Jess Lynn NYC, Jess with one S, J E S L Y N N Y C. And then if you're interested in running with me, uh, slash us, you can follow Brooklyn Track Club. And you can follow Brooklyn Trail Club. And then any of the big activations happening, you can follow Nike NYC. Awesome. Thanks so much for your time today. It was really great getting to know you. Yeah, of course. Thanks for bearing with me and all of my non-cooking answers. <laughs> it's all great. <laughs> Have a good one. Thanks. That's our show for today. I hope you all enjoyed that one. And if you did, please make sure you hit follow or subscribe wherever you listen. And if you have a minute, it would be so, so helpful if you could give me a five-star rating and review. Um, if you could write a review about something you enjoyed from this episode or a prior episode, it really does help me grow and um, continue this show. Also, if you would like to support the show financially, I do have a Patreon page. I would love to see you over in my Patreon community. Um, there are lots of great perks if you become a Patreon member for just a few bucks a month. 
And uh, those include discounts on my digital downloads, free merch, and more. So head on over to the uh, link in my show notes. It's also on my website. You can find it there. And if you're interested, join my Patreon community. Um, Lastly, if you want to get in touch with any questions or feedback or topic requests, I'd love to hear from you. Claire at eatforendurance.com is my email. You can, of course, DM me on Instagram um, and I'll respond as soon as I can. All right, guys, I hope you enjoy this episode and I'll see you all next time.